Welcome back. This is Let's Think About It, and I'm Ryder Richards. Thanks for tuning in to the first of a two-part series. So I've got a question for you. Hard work leads to success, right? I mean, that's what everyone says, my parents, coaches, teachers, and even my bosses. But what if it's no longer true that your reward is going to be equal to your effort? We covered this topic, of course, in our Tyranny of Merit episodes a couple podcasts back, and then we jumped into how guilt, shame, and common sense also tend to warp our worldview, both our internal psychology and our relation to society and others. And now we move, of course, into morals that guide our behavior in the workplace, where we spend half of our waking hours. And of course, when I mentioned morality in the workplace to my dad, he said, I'll save you a lot of time. There aren't any morals there. And he might actually be right, uh, but of course, you know, I'm not going to accept common sense just on the face of it as a truth, so I read this book anyway. In Robert Jackell's 1983-85 text, Moral Mazes, he looks at the social morality, basically the everyday rules, and he looks at the psychology and ethics that become formed in corporations that become championed, because we all know, of course, that Hard work builds character. Uh, But, you know, businessmen, they don't really have much use for somebody who continually finishes out of the money. Somebody who just can't seem to get the ball across the finish line. They reward results. Not your striving, your humility, or your character, or any of these other traits we placate losers with. Because we're winners, yeah, Team America, Texas America, right. And while we can no longer really pin down the objective standard for success in a corporation... Some people keep winning this game anyway, so there really are some rules at play to be discovered. There's a type of morality or immorality that Jack Howe maps out as a bureaucratic ethic. Protestant work ethic. We've referenced Max Weber at least three times on this podcast, and the reason is this kind of foundational nature of how Protestant values became entangled and synonymous with work and wealth, and how that led to a new bourgeois class launching capitalism. There's a notion of secular asceticism, where you subjugate your impulses to God's will, and this is through restless, continuous, systematic work in a worldly calling. Or basically, hard work and doing your job proves you love God. And maybe he loves you back, right? So you become rich and you're successful. And this signals to your community that you're the right type of person. And this does this fuzzy thing where it links morality to success, hard work to virtue and wealth, setting up an increasing inequality within the community. And this is not only a financial inequality, but it's judgmental as well. Now, one second thing, a tangent I'm going to throw in here is I think a key precedent is set here where the wealth was kept by these people, not redistributed. And these people claim to be working for the Lord. And this is kind of the schizoid thing that we see quite a bit, this kind of polarity, where your mouth claims one cause while your actions prove another. Tomas, that sure is a nice barn you're building. Thank you, Job. The Lord has blessed me, my 63 children, and my four lovely goats who work the land. What are you making that barn out of? Gold. The Lord has blessed me with so much of it that he gave me a dream to build a golden barn. So the poor, miserable sinners outside can now know his glory by staring upon my golden barn. Oh, well, that does sound like our Lord. It'll teach those wretches to have some humility. Eventually, in this entanglement of religious values with work values, the religious trappings started to slip. And this opens up conspicuous wealth and consumer culture. So all of a sudden, people are getting things like cars, boats, and building golden barns. So really, while frugality and investment started disappearing in the workplace and in society and culture, self-reliance, gumption, and that notion again that morality is linked to success, these still remain in the workplace. And also, the workplace was starting to become industrialized through Taylorism. This is a kind of Fordist assembly line for offices that really supercharges your bureaucracy. And in this new bureaucratic structure, they now took those Once human virtues, there were Christian virtues as well, a frugality, timeliness, devotion, and dedication, and they built them into the workplace through things like regularized time schedules, work procedures, and administrative hierarchies, and making uniforms uniform. And of course, if you needed somebody to worship, you have an administration up above you. In short, we centralized control and bureaucratized the economy. 
We don't need to know your character. We have spreadsheets. This system gradually replaced the old Protestant entrepreneurs. These were your small businessmen, farmers, and some of the middle class. And this bureaucratic industry, well, it spread into government and it started overwhelming the private sector and just spreading and growing and growing and it needed clerks and technicians and a myriad level of managers to maintain it. And of course it delivered on production and efficiency, but at what cost? Well, one thing that happened was a new class emerged. This was the big salaried man. And this guy was completely dependent and devoted to the corporation. I mean, so much for that old virtue of self-reliance or dedication to God or family. The shift here, as Jack L. points out, is not just being in the organization, but these people were of the organization. Part 1. Pyramid Politics Corporations centralize authority in the CEO. Now this is your king or your mob boss whose whims are law, despite this kind of bureaucracy that looks like it's rational and efficient that's surrounding them. Equally, the company is decentralizing authority throughout the organization through things like presidents and VPs and district and regional managers and blah, blah, blah. And this sets up a web of reporting up and down the hierarchy. And throughout this chain, this becomes a web of commitments. And this ties people to goals and it reinforces fealty relationships. So one of the prime contradictions is the higher up you go, the less in touch with reality the people are. And the more outrageous their demands become. I want my pyramid finished this week. Uh, sir, you freed the slaves, the water to make bricks is full of blood, and there are dead frogs everywhere. So? Okay, yes sir, we'll get right on it, sir. So to issue a command from the top triggers a cascade of downward pressure to achieve an improbable task, especially when bound by a bureaucratic system. Hence, there's a willingness to sacrifice or bend rules to achieve the king's whims. And this is seen as loyalty. And the CEOs tend to promote those who have a capacity for creative problem solving, which usually means they're doing shady shit. But you must be loyal in the right order in a company. And the rule is you should be loyal to your boss directly above you. Now, you can either help your boss out, you can save him or her from making a mistake. And meanwhile, of course, you're trying to do an impossible job. Or you can let your boss screw up whenever the pressure becomes too much. But if you let them screw up, this has two problems in an organization. One is you might get caught up in it and lose your own job. And two, other managers will probably know what you did and they'll never trust you. Therefore, you'll never get promoted. So this is long-term game here. Another tricky part is that while bosses pretend to be laid back in American corporations, they're actually demanding a level of deference where you have to do silly things like laugh at all their jokes and be sure not to make any of your own because you wouldn't want to show them up or upstage them. And equally, part of your job is to protect your boss from embarrassing themselves or the company. So yes, as I was saying, the CEO went to Harvard and Yale, and he has an Olympic gold medal in the sexathlon. Rudy, Rudy, why are you coughing, Rudy? Why are you coughing so loudly? I'm in the middle of a story, Rudy. Please stop tugging on my jacket. Oh, so anyway, yes, after the aliens abducted me and they probed my nethers, they revealed that our CEO's actual identity is that he's Tom Cruise in disgust. Rudy, for God's sake, man, quit. Call. Are you all right? Yes, yes, okay, fine. I'll go with you to get your pills from the car. Jeez, you look horrid. Now, as Jack Al says, the subordinate must symbolically reinforce at every turn his own subordination and his willing acceptance of the obligations of his fealty. So yeah, you just have to be your boss's little bitch. And yet we must remember that even your boss, whom you may envy and resent, has bosses above them pressuring them. So as a manager, you're despised by your subordinates, but you need them to be happy so they don't sabotage you, or else you're completely dependent on their own ambitions to get them to act properly. And of course, you have to act tough and demanding to the top brass, right, to the CEO, so you can be seen by them as somebody who gets results. And it's kind of likely that these people are dealing with impossible pressures at all points in time, and they might be fired at any chance. And of course, they're having to protect their own turf and their own budget from opposing factions, while also currying favor with the king who's just applauding all the intrigues and court games being played. Bravo. Bravo. Credit and the king. 
In a corporation, details are pushed down and credit is pulled up. Bosses give vague instructions. Reportedly, this is to encourage your subordinates to have autonomy. Figure it out. I don't need to know the details. But really, this is a cover-your-ass method because typically your boss doesn't understand the details. And as one manager says, if I take the time to tell you what to do, I have invested myself. And then I can't ball you out if things don't work. So this is another rule, right? Where you always set up a fall guy if, in case things don't work and you get to say, I had nothing to do with it. And this takes the pressure off the manager and it puts it on to the subordinate. And of course, as a subordinate, if you do get the impossible task done, well, you don't get any credit for it because of course that flows up to the top. But you're then known as a good team player. Here's a nice pat on the rump. Hmm, keep it up and I'll pat you on the rump every day. Now, credit or praise is a currency in the workplace, and it's not to be casually bestowed. It's to be used at the boss's prudence. Perhaps public perception demands a little bit of fairness here and there, but credit can be handed out from the boss to anyone, and it's primarily for political reasons. So when it's handed out, it's to strengthen fealty amongst his own. This type of sagacity or shrewdness is especially egregious around the CEO, the king, of course, where managers engage in irrational budget expenditures just to appease a perceived preference, a wish, or a whim. Anything to look good despite the costs. And Jack Al talks of them doing things like repainting a whole building to impress a CEO coming for a visit, or dropping 10K on a custom-made book. And really, the justification is, if you don't appease the capricious king or queen today, your head could be on a pike tomorrow. Equally, your position, your livelihood... It's never really secure under a king because their whims or moods may destroy you. And this leads to people obsessing about little things like what the CEO wears, who they were talking to, what they talk about, and what they're watching on Netflix. Because your fate may end up depending on it. This perpetuates an anxious and nervous workplace riddled with fear and precarity. With everyone really looking at the king for cues on how they can prove their loyalty. So when a CEO does get nervous and he thinks maybe something's going on, he has this tool, it's called the shakeup, and it's where they reorganize the whole company. And this does a number of things. It reorganizes existing fealty or alliances, it breaks up plots or troublesome dissenters by shifting them around, it also hides mistakes. And now no one is really sure where the blame should land when things go sideways. Now, this makes the board in Wall Street think that you're aggressive, a bare-knuckle fighter in there duking it out. Now, you may get lucky, if someone you're loyal to in this shakeup gets promoted, right? Because positions open up, and that may lead to you also getting promoted. But on the other side of this, you may get fired. And why would you get fired? Well, it's not because of your performance or a lack of dedication. No, no, it's because the CEO had a bad month or a bad day. And this is the sort of strange, contingent, anxiety-riddled world of corporations. Part 2 Success and failure. Striving for success is a moral imperative in America. If you're young and ambitious, you really have one main chance to rise. So corporations set up a system of roles and hurdles. And as Jack Al says, leaping over successively higher hurdles in school marks you well for being able to handle the probationary trials of corporate life. But, of course, once you become a manager, it's more ambiguous and vague. So there's a level where you have proven your competency, and this is basically a grading scale that you have to pass to get to the next level. And beyond that, it becomes much more about social factors. And it's where you align yourself with the ethos and style of the corporation. So if you want to rise, you have to remake yourself into what the company desires by staying attuned to social cues. Now, this is known as self-rationalization or self-streamlining, and it sounds a bit sociopathic but we probably all do it to a certain extent. Jack L says, Such a manager dispassionately takes stock of himself, treating himself as an object, as a commodity. He analyzes his strengths and weaknesses, and decides what he needs to change in order to survive and flourish in his organization. And then he systematically undertakes a program to reconstruct his image. So step one, appearance. Easiest thing to change. Indeed, the clothes do make the man. So just look at what the CEO is wearing. Wear that. Self-control. Step two. Control all emotion behind a mask of amenable blandness. Mm. Never lose your temper. Never reveal a secret. Managers believe it's a fatal weakness to lose self-control. 
it means you can't be trusted. Now, there's a story Jackal tells of a president whose mistress is also a manager in the same company. Now, the president's wife learns of the affair and threatens to use her stock options to actually harm the company. And then it gets sloppier than that because somehow the president purloins company funds and uses them as hush money to pay off the mistress's husband. And then it keeps getting worse because then the president and VP end up double teaming the mistress and the president's car in the parking lot during a company party. And of course, everyone knows what's going on. And when asked about it, no one in the company has any moral qualms because of course you're not supposed to have them. What they have instead is outrage at his lack of being in control. Being out of control poses a risk to the company and to their image in case anyone finds out. And your image is your survival. Part three, be a team player. First of all, convictions of any sort are suspect, as mentioned in the previous step. To me, a person can have any beliefs they want as long as they leave them at home. It really detracts from your versatility as a manager to have ethics or morality. They can't put you into any position at that point, only specific ones. Yet, of course, they say leave things at home, but then they're going to look at your home life and say, if a man can't manage his wife, how can he manage other people? So appearances become important. And that's also part of being a team player. It's to be seen putting in the long hours. Most of which aren't actually spent working. They're spent in social rituals, shoring up alliances and friendships, earning goodwill. And this seems to be universal across all corporations. Now, managers, what do they want? They want a team player who will agree with consensus, even though they personally disagree. As one manager says, you indict a person by saying he isn't a team player. It's because he voices an objection. And even if the objection is right, that just pisses off the manager. It doesn't help anybody. Now, another manager, someone who is talking about team play, is out to squash dissent. The troublemaker is often a creative person, but creative people don't get ahead. Dependable team players do. In fact, bosses don't want to hear the truth. Pretty blunt. So the best thing you can do as a team player is to cheerfully agree with anything and everything wearing your mask of a bland smile. Now here's the other side. It can't just be bland smiles, right? You have to have style. So this is step four. Be witting, charming, affable, articulate, and with an indefinable sophistication. When you give reports, presentations, or you have to mingle with people, give the appearance of knowledge even when you're lacking it. This is, of course, a carefully cultivated mask, much like Patrick Bateman discusses in American Psycho, where you self-streamline to maximize your success in a world that only champions appearances. There well may be moral struggles and anxiety behind that mask, but a good manager will not allow you to see them. Part 3. Social Performance So yes, I know that it's hard to believe that being a chameleon, being good at team play, and having some lucky connections is all it takes to succeed in a corporation. What about profits and performance, Ryder? Well, yes. You do have to hit your numbers most of the time. But Jack Owl even shows that if you're hitting all your numbers all the time, but you're lacking the right personality traits or team play, maybe you don't have the right clothes, you're never going to rise. You might have protections from someone in the central network, the higher-ups, and that might be able to stave off some detractors from putting a negative spin on you because this is all social, right? It's all perception. But also, if the CEO has already picked somebody for some position, well, you're digging your grave by pointing out the obvious flaws in that person. You better just smile and get on board. But you might plan to, you know, mitigate the risks whenever it backfires. And you're also going to notice little of this has to do with performance. This is all politicking and social networking. Now, when there's no longer an objective standard for success, it isn't your performance that breaks you. It is other people. Managers realize more than most that there's a capriciousness to their advancement. And this is often based on organizational contingency. You might have been lucky to be moved to the right division before the previous one went under. Your old boss and patron might have been promoted, which lets you be promoted. It's chance as much as anything. And lots of people lose their jobs. And while a cardinal rule of managers is to attempt to protect their own, fire as many staff as you like, managers protect managers. They also realize that there's only so many places at the top. And so there's always a struggle to prove yourself, and it's pretty cutthroat, and it becomes this never-ending Sisyphean task. And of course, all that's only internal to the company. 
What about things like market fluctuations, recessions, or EPA legislation? Well, I don't know. How do you do something like explain a market surge? Because it's actually just as bad for a manager's production numbers to be too high as to be too low. Why would more profit be bad? Well, it's because it undercuts the illusion of rational control and planning. This is the illusion of competence, and in a political realm, that can be used against you. So even while you're living in this anxiety from a volatile CEO, markets in recession, other managers smiling blandly while stabbing them in the back, or employees that resent them, managers really aren't heartless or unconflicted. They're just really good with the masks, right? They're very aware of the optics, and it might actually be a key point to their survival. And they also realize that the only thing they can do to better ensure their fate is to be seen working hard, putting in the hours, even though productivity may not even help them. And it's also better streamlining yourself, wearing the right masks, practicing the right vocabularies of discourse, knowing the right people, and subtly self-promoting. Oh yeah, and uh, hide your copy of Machiavelli and keep that resume updated. So thanks for sticking with me on that. This is a basic outline of the first half of Moral Mazes. There's, of course, a whole lot more in there we didn't get to but it's a way to map out the rules to play by in a corporation. And you can see that it really sets up fealty over truth. And there's this kind of go-long-to-get-ahead ethic that I think is very problematic. And next week, we're going to talk about how this social structure promotes short-term gains and how rationality is subverted, and we end up with something like the 2008 recession harming the entire nation, and a lot of that was developed from these unspoken rules of corporate ethics. So please, if you have a moment, rate and review the show, and maybe try to think of a friend in the corporate world. Maybe send them this episode and see if it lines up with their experiences. All right, thanks for listening. 